Hi, everyone. We'll get started in just a moment. Hey, everyone. This is Steve. Um, just to let everyone know, I'm going to have to jump off a little bit early because I have an executive board meeting. Um, so I just have to make sure I'm ready for that. But I'm really excited about this meeting. There's a lot of really good stuff going on uh, in today's task force. Are any of our chairs I don't think so. And Steve, we will have the recording available as well. Okay, shall we start, Leslie? So we'll call the meeting to order at 1203. I'll go ahead and take roll. I'm Stephanie Hilferty. Senator Beth Mizell. Ileana Lede. I'm present. John Moeller. Stephen Procopio. Present. Thank you. Stephen Procopio. Present. Michael Tipton. Libby Sonier. Here. Ali Bustamante. Present. And Melissa Gudo. Present. Okay, so today we are very excited about the speakers that we have joining this task force to share information. Um, first, we're going to hear from some of our Louisiana colleagues about strategies that they're pursuing in their local communities. Then we'll have some time for discussion and Q&A with those speakers. Next, we'll hear about some additional things happening around the country in Colorado, Nebraska, and Florida. And then we'll conclude with some final discussion to plan for our December 8th task force meeting and really make sure that at that meeting, um, we have enough information and speakers to really help this task force begin drafting up the recommendations to be made to the commission. So thank you everybody so much for joining us today. Um, I think that you were all here last time, but I'm Karen Powell. I am the Deputy Assistant Superintendent for Early Childhood Strategy here at the Louisiana Department of Education, and we appreciate all of your service on this task force. So I think we're going to start um, with Libby Sonier introducing our local Louisiana panelists today. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce um, colleagues and now friends from Ascension Parish, John Diaz, as well as Mayor Friday Ellis from the city of Monroe, and then Superintendent Dr. Cito um, Narcisse will be joining us within probably the next two to five minutes as he's racing to his office to join us today to hear about the work that they're all engaged in, uh, really to about expanding access to early care and education and, and ensuring that it is quality early care and education and what they're doing locally and how they're planning to fund that work. Um, it's different than what we've heard before from what Orleans is doing, Jefferson and Caddo Parish, which is equally as wonderful. But this, are, this is really about how locals have said this is a priority for us. We want to make sure that we increase um, early quality, early care and education in our communities. And, and this is our plan and this is our bold vision. Um, and so I'll kick it over to John Diaz right now, who I can see is here, but not see him. John, you're on mute if you're talking.
Let me. Well, Mayor Ellis is here, so we'll kick it to Mayor Ellis first, and then um, we'll let John go after him. All right, now that I'm unmuted, is everybody, can everybody hear me? Yes, thank you. Excellent, thank you, Libby. Well, it's, uh, I'm really excited to be here today, just to tell you a little bit about myself. I uh, grew up in rural America in a little town called Rayville. Uh, just east of Monroe and, um, you know, joined the Marine Corps, uh, started a business, and now I've uh, been in my term as mayor of the city of Monroe for a little over a year right now. Uh, I'm also married to an educator. Uh, she is the assistant principal at Neville Junior High, and she also uh, serves on Bessie uh, District 5, representing uh, 19 rural parishes uh, here in Northeast Louisiana. Um, and as you can probably already know, early childhood is something, uh, education and quality care is something near and dear to my heart. Uh, I can talk to you all day about statistics that you probably already know, but I'm gonna share a very personal story with you. Um, my daughter, Ari, uh, came to us at about 18 months and we adopted. Uh, she was nonverbal uh, and probably the most precious things I've ever put my eyes on. And uh, we uh, knew early on that um, her being nonverbal came from just not being um, given the attention and care and love um, given to a child that they, they need and deserve. Uh, what we found out really quickly through quality care and quality instruction and, and love in a stable home uh, came uh, a little girl who really closed that gap quickly. Um, you know, it says a lot about environment and education and quality instruction and care. Um, you know, we're not a family of means as you know, being married to uh, an educator and at the time being a, a cigar shop owner, we weren't necessarily rolling in the dough, uh, but we, uh, we did find it hard to find quality care and instruction for our child. Um, there was a waiting list and there's always a waiting list and that is, um, something that even we as fairly connected in the community that we were, uh, found it difficult to find childcare for our kids. And so of course it's me taking off work. Uh, it's Ashley burning sick days at work or vacation time. And, uh, you know, that's where, you know, that's a little personal story where it hits home. Uh, I always say my wife, uh, she's working on this thing uh, on the front end to get kids educated and give them a quality education uh, it's my job on the back end to create an environment that's conducive for them to be employed. Um, one of my times, and, and, and we'll go into talking about why I believe, you know, early child care and early education, childhood education is an economic development issue. Um, and, and I think that's something that my time as mayor that I've really tried to drive that point home with the chamber and with uh, our current our local stakeholders that this is just as much uh, about economic development and prosperity and opportunity for families as anything else. Um, my time, I'm going to talk a lot about my wife because she's in the mix, but uh, a lot of our family conversations rotate around, you know, uh, this subject. Um, the only time outside of education, my wife worked as the um, regional HR director for Target. Uh, one of the biggest things to find uh, quality employment for her um, her workers was families in need of childcare and the cost of, you know, quality instruction and care as well. And that was one of the biggest things that kept folks from actually joining the workforce there. And you had single mothers or single fathers or parents that were, you know, wanting to enter the workforce, um, but they, you know, they couldn't find quality care so they'd stay home with their children. Um, and what that means is, you know, that's kitchen table budgeting one-on-one, -on -one. that's disposable income. Um, that our families desperately needed, but they couldn't find the quality care that they needed. Um, there was also a time I can remember Ashley was working for a central office in Lincoln Parish, and she got the phone call from the mayor at the time that talked about they wanted to know why ACT scores um, have dropped over the last two years. Well, uh, being an educator, she quickly had the response that said, well, you know, previous years, they didn't require every student to take the ACT. But over the past two years, uh, they're requiring every child to take the ACT. And so she already had that. But the point I'm trying to make is, is that, you know, um, these companies, as they start to dwindle down their uh, list of 
potential areas where they're going to locate their companies. Um, they really look at the quality education, quality care, and these is, you know, what kind of environment are we going to move our, our companies to and what kind of quality care do they have for our families that, that we can potentially relocate families to. So uh, with all that being said, um, I got introduced to Libby a while back, a very passionate person in, in, in our work uh, in education. And she has came to Monroe and she heard our vision of what we would like to do. And uh, we're really working with uh, Libby and uh, National League of Cities, um, Superintendent Brumley and a few other people and our uh, uh, Children's Coalition United Way to talk about um, what a uh, what a what a citywide um, from policy to the way that we develop neighborhoods all the way down to quality care and instruction, what that looks like from a municipality. And I've, I've never really uh, thought about it that way until I sat down with some people who were just as passionate about it as, as, as I am. Um, one cool thing about being a mayor and being an executive is, is that you have uh, all these buckets and, and of money that are there. So you've got CDBG dollars that can be spent uh, you've got uh, entitlement dollars that can be spent. Uh, we started taking a look at our villages from library villages to our, uh, all the way down to mosquito abatement. Uh, who's got money? Sorry. This is uh, <laughs> Michelle just, hey, this is my communications director, Michelle Martin. She thought she would be slick and take a photo in here. Sorry. <laughs> That's this camera. But, uh, but no, we found some people who are just as passionate to help us guide and to understand what's been successful in other cities and, and how these how these programs have done and not necessarily reinvent the wheel, but but mayor, what are some things you can do early on to get this thing going? And what are some long term strategies that we can put together? Um, I do know that I, we have rec centers and community centers here in Monroe that are vacant during the day. Um, one of the things that we're looking at is to uh, work with our local um, community college work with our local uh, you know, early child care providers to be able to use those as incubator spaces for uh, type one child care providers uh, to be able to operate inside of our rec centers. Um, as a business owner, what I, what I know is, is that if we can enter a cooperative endeavor with some of these providers, that lowers their cost of operation down and then they can put that, those dollars rather than to paying light bills or rent, they can put that into programming or staffing or to put those dollars where they belong is to the children uh, to be able to do this and to open up extra seats. And so that's one of the first things that we're going to start doing is, is opening up our rec centers uh, and being able to provide quality care for people who want to enter the workforce or to open those extra seats uh, for children in our community. And I think we've got a good team. Uh, I think we've got uh, the right people at the table and some momentum going and, um, Hopefully by February, we're going to announce um, uh, our, our plan and, and the roadmap to get there. But I really do, as a mayor, um, I, I'm really excited about looking at what healthy communities look like, not only through the you know, um, cognitive development, but through nutritional development and everything that goes along with uh, a healthy environment for a kid to learn and a stable environment for a kid to learn. Um, the discussion came up like I know with any good organization, who's going to drive it, right? Um, we got, there's, we know that sometimes I always tell my team, I said, guys, it feels like everything that leaves second floor or our office uh, sometimes get lost in the mix. And so uh, I think fairly soon, uh, Libby, she's going to give me a high five for this. We're going to name uh, our early child care, whatever the name is going to be, liaison and, and, he or she is going to work out of our economic development uh, office. And um, I think that sends a clear signal to our community of where we believe the importance lies uh, in education and also to the business community and our, and our other shareholders, uh, how we are sending a signal that this is not only a quality of life issue, this is also an economic development issue and we need to treat both as such. And uh, we're going to be making that announcement soon as well. But uh, we're really excited to work with folks uh, around the state through the nation to do what we do. Um, 
And so we can go back to talk about how we can fund it or answer questions earlier, but the low hanging fruit would be CDBG dollars as community uh, block grants that are there within the city. Um, but right now we're looking for a reoccurring revenue source. And uh, so there is something that I'm working with Monroe PD on right now um, that we can find a way, even talking with diversion money from the DA, diversion money from when the city courts to, 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 to braid together. So slowly we're starting to piece this thing together, but we're, we're identifying a reoccurring revenue source and eventually uh, the state of Louisiana will get it right and uh, provide the juice we need to, to include that in the MFP. But uh, again, I, I'm, I'm so excited uh, to be having this conversation. Um, my wife and I both years ago, I mean, I, I had my dream job uh, and my wife's in education and she loves what she does, but you know, as a, as a couple, we came together and said, look, you know, we can complain about the things that we need to do, or we can throw our name in the hat and go after the policies and go after the things that, that keep children from learning or, uh, you know, uh, teachers from uh, getting the resources that they need. In the same way here, uh, I can start going after the policies that, that, that have kept this environment to grow business and conducive to business and attack some quality uh, projects that help um, felt needs in a community. And so we together, we decided to run and do it. And now uh, we know what it means when the dog catches the car. Uh, what do you do with it now? And uh, it's been great. And I, I love the job and I love every minute of it. And to be able to work with folks every day, uh, such as yourself and uh, everyone on this call uh, who are very passionate about what they do. Uh, and you put passionate and driven people in a room together, you can come up with some great stuff. And so, uh, that's some, some initial thoughts of where we are uh, here in Monroe, and I look forward to hearing from uh, these the other speakers today to hear some amazing things that they're doing in their community. But I, I appreciate you giving me an opportunity uh, to present to you today, and uh, if you have any questions after the speakers, uh, I'll hang around and answer anything that I can. Thank you. Thanks so, thanks so much, Mary Alice. We so appreciate you being here with us today. Uh, and I know there'll be questions. So um, John Diaz from Ascension Parish, um, you are next. All right, Libby, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, I apologize for the technical difficulties. This has been one of those weeks. Um, all right, well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here, um, but I have to be honest with you, uh, our involvement from a parish standpoint in early childhood education was by and large an accident. Um, Though I do have some background, uh, I worked for Lobby uh, uh, several years ago and was good friends with Bridget Neeling. So though I had the, you know, the 50,000 foot view of what early childhood education meant, I never really did a deep dive in it. And uh, in 2019, Paris president asked me to serve on his transition team. And uh, while I was doing that, I was doing a lot of research into evidence-based budgeting. How do we budget for outcomes? How do we demonstrate some type of measure or profit uh, uh, as it relates to services. And just about every article kept referencing the Perry Preschool Study. So I would go back and read the Perry Preschool Study uh, over and over again. And, and, and at some point I kind of got uh, infatuated with the, pre the, early, the Perry Preschool Study more than evidence-based budgeting. But I told myself during the transition, if I ever get a hold of this budget and I can find resources to do this, uh, we're gonna do it. And, and, and like Mr. Ellis stated, uh, we see this as a quality of life issue, um, you know, Ascension Parish is the wealthiest parish in the state of Louisiana, um, but we have the second worst city in the country to live in, according to USA Today. Um, you know, we see this as the fourth multipliers in early childhood education is just it, it, hard to measure. I mean, it's a, it, it's a fix to poverty. Uh, it's a fix to our criminal justice system. It's a fix to our education system. Um, and so we're excited to do it. Um, and I'll be honest with you, while we was going through the very first budget, I got to this line item that said juvenile justice program. And so I went to finance, I said, what is this? And they said, well, it's a one mil property tax that we passed in 2013. And we use about half a million dollars a year to, to send uh, juvenile uh, delinquents to the St. Bernard Juvenile Detention Center. And we're saving the rest. And in 20 years, we're gonna build a juvenile detention center. And I just looked at it, I said, I, I can't think of a dumber idea because uh, it's just a bad business model. We're gonna sit here and put 100% of everything in our juvenile justice system and to a punitive approach to juvenile delinquency as opposed to a pre preventative. And two, here's the other thing, in 20 years when we have enough money to build this juvenile uh, detention center, this one mill property tax is not generating enough money to, for the O&M on it. So it's just a bad business model altogether. Um, so I went and met with the sheriff's department, I went and met with the school board, 
um, you know, and we all came together and said, you know, you're right, let's do something different with it. Uh, shared with them the Perry Preschool study and several other studies out there that, you know, just demonstrated the, the results that you get with early childhood education. Um, kind of did a Paris wide tour, uh, all the rotaries, the chambers, and went to the council in, in 2020 and asked them to reprogram this money for an early childhood education center. Um, so, and, and so when you're looking for revenue sources, uh, and Ms. Ellison, I don't know if you realize this, the legislature passed a law that allows local governments without a vote of the people to impose a one mill property tax. Now, for juvenile delinquency, but if you go back and read the law, there is one little sentence in there that says, you know, uh, are children in need of attention or care? And so my attorney said, well, John, that's enough for you to reprogram this from a juvenile detention center to an early childhood education center. And so that's, that's what we did, basically. We just reprogrammed that money. Um, I'm excited to say that right now our fund balance is at about $8.2 million. So we hope in the next quarter of next year to start designing the building, um, you know, and we'll have the whole whole concept of this stuff is not only to have money for the, the upfront building, but to have reoccurring uh, 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 revenue. And so this, this tax will generate $1.5 million. Um, our plan, once we get it going, is then to start approaching the school board, approaching the sheriff's department, as well as a lot of private industry in Ascension Parish to help fund this. Um, so, you know, that's it in a nutshell. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing, you know, the, the technology, the, the science and research that goes into brain development, the fact that 80% of a kid's brain is developed by the time he's four years old. And when you look at some of our problems in, on the West Bank in the city of Donsonville, um, you know, it's 12, only 12.6% 12 of the kids start kindergarten at reading level. And when you get to some of more affluent school districts on the East Bank, it's, it's like 50 or 60%. So, our first fix in Donsonville is to close the achievement gap. And because if you go back and look at the West Bank schools, it, over, the, over the last four years, they've improved by about 24 or 25 points pretty consistently. Um, if you look at the, the schools in Dutchtown from primary to, uh, to middle to, to high school, they improved pretty consistently by eight points. So my point is, and, and what I stress to everybody, is these kids on the West Bank in a structured environment can learn, but look where they start off. And so that was the whole thrust of us getting involved in it is just can we close the achievement gap as the first fix to improve in Donsonville and, and turning around the economy. Um, the second thing is we're, we're building this. Um, it, it, it used to be an old school West Ascension Elementary. We're in the process of demolishing it now, um, but we're building it adjacent to a sheriff's substation and, and also a park. And, and our whole point is we're trying to integrate um, as a community oriented policing component into this. So we're, we're about to launch a fundraiser to raise money for after school programs. And we actually want to pay, and as an example, or, or, or this is replicated in Orange County, Florida, they call it PAL, Police Athletic League, where they play, pay police officers salaries to coach these kids soccer, basketball, you know, whatever it is. But then also on the weekend, put them on the bus, take them to Slidell, let them stay in a hotel, and let them actually do a lot of the things that, that we don't have access to. And, you know, it's when we first started this, when it first reached out to Living, and we had 5.6 million, I think, to build this facility, um, but our, our property taxes are growing at such a rapid rate, now we have 8.2. So I reached out to DD Bro, and I don't know how many of you guys believe purple and gold, but she used to be the gym coach at LSU, and she also from Donsonville. And I said, DD, could you help me with this program? Because what I really want to do with some of this extra money, $2 million, is build facilities like like a gymnasium where these kids can learn gymnastics and other things that they don't have access to. And I'll be honest with you, my daughter was in both dance and gym. And finally I went to her and said, you gotta pick one because it's just, it, it, you can't afford it. So our whole plan is, to, is to, to, to not only be an early childhood education center, but to be an after school uh, resource for these students. And uh, you know, I'll take any questions or comments. I think we'll come back for questions and comments, John. Thanks so much. Sure. We appreciate it. Um, and now Dr. Cito Narcisse, who is superintendent of EBR Schools. Thanks, Dr. Sonia. Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Um, uh, here in East Baton Rouge, we're pretty excited about um, kind of the direction we're going uh, into this where we see early childhood as we call them bookends here, right? So uh, we talked a lot about the cradle to pipeline work. So the early childhood is the beginning portion of that. And then workforce development is the end, end book point where we're trying to connect 
more, more of schools to jobs and industries across the city. Um, and we're really excited about, uh, since we've been working with, uh, with Libby and Louisiana Policy Institute about trying to pilot a different way around um, moving the work in early childhood. One thing we noticed, I noticed pretty quickly when I arrived um, was um, I've been in other places and looked at models on how we even interpret early childhood here. And early child education is, uh, is really from zero to four. And we, we look like on our end, we only were investing actually in four-year-olds, not as much as in three, two, or one. And that is a big challenge, uh, especially we thought about as a city, we have so much more opportunities to do much more than we ever should uh, around this space. And so we've been really working really hard to expand those seats. I mean, as you probably know, uh, Louisiana, we just passed kindergarten. And I always would tell folks that, you know, kindergarten is a little too late <laughs> in the process, even though we should be excited that we've passed that law, but we should be looking for a law to pass early childhood um, uh, to get kids uh, into school early because kids fall behind before they actually get to kindergarten. Uh, and the gap doesn't start uh, just once they start going from kindergarten, first grade, second grade. So one of the main things we've been doing is twofold. Number one is um, we've been pushing hard to expand the models in early childhood. So we've invested our own dollars into expanding more seats. So we've expanded over a thousand more seats um, in, in uh, EBR. Uh, for early childhood. Um, and we thank uh, through the support with the state and also with Dr. Saunier around the model. Um, uh, specifically in third grade, we've added more about 200, 213 more seats. In um, fourth grade, we, uh, for ages four, I'm sorry, not fourth grade, uh, ages four, we added uh, 816 new seats. But where our anxiety is still high is that we don't tap into zero, one, two, right? And I think that what we, um, with Dr. Saunier's help, what we've been doing is piloting uh, what we call micro centers and uh, where you are able to take a um, child care and put it actually in a school. So you can help influence the instructional model as those children feed into um, into the into the school pipeline. And uh, right now, we feel like we're moving in the right direction around that. Um, we've been talking a lot about um, our plan, not only as we've been funding it, but also with our strategic plan. Um, as as in most cities, as Dr. Sonia probably can tell you, there's a lot of ways how to make sure that funding continues. Whether you do that public-private partnerships, or you can you know increase tax for that but but what's the bigger context on trying to make sure that children from zero to four is in school is it actually begins to help close gaps as early as possible for families and children before they even get to kindergarten or first grade second grade and one of the, the the one of the strategies that we're hopeful to continue to push and lead is that we are showing folks that if you begin in the early space to invest in early childhood in moving towards that direction, then it will help you to close gaps faster and actually you know, pro provide more acceleration for children in schools. Um, this is not a new phenomenon, as many of you already know. Um, it's just, we just have not done it here as of yet. <laughs> and uh, we're pretty excited about that. We also have you know, diverse delivery models um, which we can talk about. Um, I think that um, uh, one of the things I say all the time is, you know, in Baton Rouge, we are uh, untapped potential. <laughs> and I just feel like, you know, like now's the time to strike the iron hot as we can kind of accelerate more of our, our work. Um, the last thing I would also say is um, um, yeah, with this model around being really progressive and pushing towards early education for children, you actually help districts uh, in a different way of, of instead of being an intervention type of district, if you have a challenging district, to be a much more accelerated district because you have kids connected much more earlier to schools. Uh, there is a notion at times that people say, well, if you're a poor child, then you know you're gonna you know, you're going to fall behind more than a child who's middle class or a, a child who comes from having. The reality is even middle class families uh, need support just as much as a poor child does in terms of trying to get them in the early pipeline because, you know, those families are all working as well. And so I think that there's a lot of opportunities that we have that we just have not uh, expanded on yet. And uh, we're trying to we're pretty excited about that if we have it our way. Um, our goal here in EBR is to make sure that we um, get as many 
uh, childhood centers either in our schools or create early childhood centers across the city in our specifically in some of our most dense uh, population areas. So then we can begin to expand and accelerate on how we're uh, supporting children all the way through the pipeline. And then that will also allow us to provide more opportunities as early as possible uh, in the work. Um, if many of you may or may not know in terms of our data, we only at one time we're only servicing 40% of our at risk uh, children at age three. Uh, one thing we always say in EBR is, you know, we are servicing 90% of at risk children. But we also know that, you know, um, our parish is not only at risk, we have many, many parents that we have to try to reach out to to give them more options, high quality options across our city. So we're looking at much more creative ways to expand that uh, so we can make sure that families fall into that pipeline as early as possible. So when we begin to put acceleration options, uh, it helps them to be more connected to schools in a very different way. Uh, and we think that that is uh, uh, when you look at places that have done some of this work, um, we think that that's uh, kind of the way that uh, will help us accelerate the work. We're also going to be bringing to our board shortly, a, um, uh, we're working actually with uh, a group, uh, Dr. Sonia and group to create a strategic plan to, to show how we can sustain this model. Um, as you know, uh, every time we put something new up, the question is not always about whether it's a good idea. <laughs> it's always, you know, what's the sustainability question? And so uh, we believe in, you know, you, you know, you don't ever ask a, uh, uh, when you're taking off in a plane, you don't tell the pilot to slow down, you tell the pilot to accelerate to take off. <laughs> so uh, we're going to keep pushing hard to uh, make sure that we can take off and expand more across our city. And, and we also believe that the partners across the city are, are clear about that. And also even with the Department of Education, it's really helped us a lot with, you know, we've been using some of our ESSER dollars in other spaces to at least get us off the ground. But uh, it's yielding tremendous, tremendous amount of results. I tell folks, it's nothing like walking into an early childhood center and you watch a three-year-old, you know, starting to kind of read alphabet and read. And, you know, while you hear people debating that, you know, kids that are in kindergarten, first and second, that can't do that. Just think about the type of opportunities that you provide in an early space that helps you to accelerate children across the city. And so we're really excited about that. Thanks so much, Dr. Narcisse. I want to um, preface this too, is like all three leaders uh, what I've appreciated about is that they really understand the business side of early child childhood providers in our across their communities um, and, and really partnering with child care centers, type three child care centers and making sure that there are accessible options and how they want to use their funds, whether it's through school board, whether it's through, you know, uh, Ascension Parish with parish government or city government, like how they can really use those local resources they have to invest in children in small businesses that are child care providers. Um, I think that that's really an exciting time. But now we'll open it up for questions um, for these three for these three leaders. I'll chime in and just ask, I guess this is an open-ended question for all three of you. You know, Given the availability of funds that each of you outlined, it, it strikes me that there's very little reason why a mayor or a superintendent or a parish could not find some set of resources to be investing in the space more thoughtfully than they are today. Um, given that we're highlighting the three of you as sort of examples doing the work, and obviously there's lots that aren't, do you have thoughts of what those barriers are and, and what uh, we or others can be doing to eliminate those barriers? Yeah, I could share, Michael, from my end. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty clear that the city has to come up with a few um, um, realities, as I would say. Um, I don't think uh, for us here in our parish that anyone disagrees about early childhood, but the question is the funding, right? And I think our reality is, you know, there are cities that have made a commitment to say, hey, we're going to raise X uh, percentage for tax to that happen. Or there's this public-private partnership that partners, business groups, various uh, groups work together to do. And the reality is, is the, the engagement that 
you have to have in order to do that helps people to see, well, if we make this investment, the long-term impact is huge, not only from like educating kids, but from a socioeconomic standpoint, right? Because, you know, as I shared before, you know, we talk about our Credo Career Pipeline work, it's a bookend, right? You start off early in this investment. And so by that time that they get to, you know, workforce ready and connecting into jobs, that that helps to close that gap. Um, but I, I, I will say this, it's a very hard lift uh, because the reality is, you know, depending on what the community context is, depending on, you know, the political content, there's so many variables in play is that you have to have a very um, robust and inclusive approach to trying to move that. Um, I, as a superintendent, I tell this all the time, cannot move that by myself, right? But, you know, when you have various partners uh, being able to do that and also various contexts in cities in terms of resource allocation, uh, that makes a, bit, a, a bigger difference to get to that marker. I mean, even now when I sit and talk to the mayor here, uh, you know, it's, you know, I talked to her about Head Start and some of these other things. We're talking a lot about what are ways we can begin having these sets of conversations so we can decide what's going to be our push towards that. But I think that, that that's where the heavy lift is. Um, and and there, there are models we can look at across the country. Uh, Dr. Sonia can give you more examples of that that have been able to push in that area. But context matters, right, in terms of the community, um, how ready they are. And I think here in, in uh, East Baton Rouge, uh, you know, they are definitely ready to have early childhood. What will that look like and how much investment we're going to do in that will determine how fast we accelerate opportunities for children at an early age, which I think cut down on a lot of things that people don't see. You know, if kids are more educated, they're more engaged in schools, you know, the less you got to worry about crime, the more you got to worry about opportunities in workforce. It just, it fills into so many ways. I think always sometimes the challenge is, you know, people want an immediate gratification or something that they feel they could see right now. And, uh, and that this is kind of the space I think we have to kind of work through that. Mayor Ellis or John? I'll, uh, and John, maybe you can, maybe you can chime in. Uh, I think what we fight sometimes as elected officials, so just to give you a little context, uh, the city of Monroe and Washita Parish have two separate school systems. So there's the city of Monroe school system and the Washita Parish school system. <clears throat> and the city of Monroe and, the, and Monroe city school systems are two separate entities, although we work together with two separate funding sources and two sets of governing bodies. Now, a lot of things that we fight sometimes is when we go into millages or we talk about spending taxpayer dollars, on my end, we'll say, well, don't we have Monroe City Schools who takes care of that? Well, I say, can't those two worlds exist at the same time? And aren't we here to support one another and to do things that we know can help one another? Um, that's why I think you have may have a, a mindset sometimes with residents who go, well, there's a pothole in front of my house. Uh, that's what we pay our tax dollars for to do those things. But but you always turn right back around and say, what what do you think supports those uh, for us to maintain these roads or these sophisticated sewer systems or these sophisticated water systems or to or to actually uh, fund our uh, our premiums every month in healthcare? It takes tax dollars. It takes money in people's pockets and more careers and to, to attract these careers and, and investing in this. And when you say ROI, um, everyone can all wrap their heads around what's the biggest uh, tool or mechanism that we can use to lift ourselves out of a situation. And that's through education. And that's through uh, uh, putting yourself uh, in a position or families in a position uh, to help better care for their families and providing quality care. And so any way that we can work in tandem. So I think from a, from a mayor's position, it's my job to turn around and how to uh, redirect that conversation and, and more of help them guide that thought process into this is an investment, right? And that is going to pay off in, in the long run to help support the things that you're asking for uh, in the end. And so it is a tough, it's, it is a tough balance uh, for those. And it's about where you put priorities uh, as a community and where you go, uh, where you put priorities as a community or as an individual. 
Um, and so, but, you know, as an elected official, I serve, I serve everyone, including children. And, it, and our children can't vote. They don't have a say. And in education, adults have all kinds of advocates in the world, but where are those standing up for children? And uh, I, I know that's where I want to be. Thank you. John, anything to add? Thinking not. Any other questions for these gentlemen? Libby, I don't have a question per se, but I do just want to take a second and thank them for their vision and their efforts. And also for you for bringing them to us. I really applaud what they're doing. It is easy to continue to do the same stuff. And I think that, you know, they should be applauded for their efforts. I would agree with that. <laughs> they're pretty fantastic. And also like, just to think that this is municipal government this is district saying like, we know we have to start earlier and there are other funding pots outside of what we would traditionally think that would fund early care and education. If you think about juvenile justice dollars in Ascension Parish, like what that looks like, that's really, that's forward thinking. It's about prevention. Um, and so, and then, you know, I think about what Dr. Narcisse is doing as well as Mayor Ellis. It, Y'all, it's a good day for Louisiana children. Uh, it's just really exciting to see it. John, I think we couldn't hear you. You were on mute. I don't know if you want to trying to come off of mute or not. So I think he's, we're still having, to, there he is. He's off mute now. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you. All right, well, guys. We're... You're back on mute. technology. John, you're back on mute. Okay. So Karen, I'm going to turn it back over to you to keep us on time. Sure. So um, now we have presentations from Colorado, Nebraska, and Florida, and with us to help guide um, this, this section of discussion, we have Elizabeth Gaines with us again. So again. I'll turn it over <laughs> Here I am again. Um, no, happily again. <laughs> I, and I just want to be quick. I, I, how exciting it was to hear a city leader, a parish leader, a school district leader in real diversity of Louisiana communities that are, are trying to do this work. That's amazing. I want to catch up with each of you um, at another point about how we can be supportive at, at Children's Funding Project. Um, but will you, Karen, go back to, there's a, a few slides above here. Yeah, that one. So, so just as a reminder, as I think everything that they said was so important because what they're doing is they're taking matters in their own hands to some degree and, and creating this local infrastructure, local skin in the game, building the system that they wanna see in their communities for, for early childhood. And so now the job of this task force and you know, uh, certainly for us at Children's Funding Project is to, to really think about, you know, how can we be as supportive as possible of that work going on and then help them um, sort of leverage and, and build um, on what their local investments are with state investments with hopefully, you know, coming soon federal investments, et cetera. So, so we really, you know, just believe a lot in this notion that you've got to have local skin in the game for the reasons that are listed here. You've got to have public dollar skin in the game because that's just uh, you know where the real resources are mm. it's got to be dedicated and that what we're actually doing is is these other things about building a constituency and providing those models that then other communities look and go oh I want to do what Mayor Ellis is doing right so so I think if you go to the next one um, I just wanted to to remind everybody that there's a lot of communities in this country across the country, not just on the coast or whatever that have done this work. Um, we're gonna hear from Kathleen. So um, Kathleen Blair has joined us and she's gonna, uh, by the time we're done here, have shared some of what's going on in her small community in 
um, Florida as one example. We're gonna hear from Cody in Colorado about some of the things going on in that state. And then not on the map officially yet because of how we sort of code what a local dedicated fund is, but there's some really interesting things happening in Nebraska too. And Colton is gonna tell us about that. But just as a reminder, as we think about all the things that are going on federally with new potential revenue to support these early childhood systems, all the things that you are doing at the state level to do this, there's also really a lot of work going on at the local level to, to have skin in the game. So then if you hop to the next one, um, you can go, this is a timeline of sort of when these things started to happen across the country. But this is what I wanted to just say. And, and I was listening to the examples that um, the folks who just presented shared, and they really, a lot of them fall into this innovative um, category. So, you know, we know about some of the, the common um, ways that we can find revenue at the local level to do this work. We're trying to track what some of these innovative examples are, and I heard a few of them. I want to make sure you guys uh, know about some other ones offline if, if we get a chance to talk, but um, just wanted to say as we kick off this next sort of panel of examples, there's lots of ways that localities can generate revenue. One of the tasks, I think, of this group is to, to make sure we're not keeping a hand tied behind their back um, at the state level. And so what are the things that this group could offer up to make it easier to do these innovative things? So, so um, if we hop to the next one, I think that's all the tee up I wanted to do. Yeah. So, so, um, so Cody Belsley is somebody we've really gotten to know because there's just a lot of action in Colorado around really building robust early childhood system. And it's happening both at the state, county, and city levels. And, and Cody has been uh, sort of quietly behind the scenes involved in many of those things. And so we thought she'd be a really good person to talk to this group about what does it look like to start to think about state to local alignment of public funding. Um, Colton Ventiker, am I saying your last name right, Colton? You might be on mute, but you'll correct me if I said it wrong, um, is with the Gothenburg Improvement Company in Nebraska, Gothenburg, Nebraska. And we've gotten a chance to present together on a couple of uh, panels. And I thought that what they're doing in Nebraska is super creative. And um, you can also update us on, on the size of the community that you're working in. But I think part of what this group wanted to make sure of is that we had a real handle on, is this possible in rural communities? Can, can rural communities find ways to have skin in the game on this? And, and I you know, contend from looking at the places around the country that they can. And so um, that's part of what we're having Colton share with you. And then Kathleen Blair has joined from the Children's Services Council of Okeechobee County, Florida. And she can tell us to sort of the size of community that she's working in, but she's really part of that um, that special taxing districts uh, system that they've set up in Florida. And I can't remember who it was, maybe it was Mayor Ellis that talked about mosquito abatement, but it made me think about special taxing districts and how across this country, there's like 36,000 special taxing districts. And they're usually for things like mosquito abatement. And instead in Florida, they, they may have the mosquito abatement because I've heard there's pretty big mosquitoes in Florida, but, um, but they also have the children's services districts. And, and that has allowed um, over 10 counties in Florida to do this kind of creation of their own local dedicated revenue to support their kids. So Kathleen can talk about in one of the smaller communities mm -hmm. that's done this in Florida, what that looks like in, in that rural community. So Cody, let's just jump to you and we can pull these Great. slides down. Um, and oh yeah, but Cody's I have a slides. few. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So welcome, Cody. <laughs> thanks, Elizabeth. And thanks everyone for having me. I'm so thrilled uh, to be with y'all this morning. I am coming to you from Denver, Colorado, where it's sunny and lovely. Uh, but I will say um, I have a soft spot in my heart for Louisiana. I'm a big uh, jazz music fan and uh, have been sad with all the cancellations of Jazz Fest, but I am keeping my fingers crossed that I'll be back in Louisiana next spring. Um, as Elizabeth said, I am a state and local policy geek. I have been working in Colorado at both the state and local levels for about 20 years. I did a short stint in the governor's office. Um, have worked in the public and private sectors and have pretty extensive campaign experience. 
Um, in the great state of Colorado, we have adopted a taxpayer's bill of rights constitutional amendment, which requires that anytime we increase taxes in the state, it has to be approved by voters. And so as a result, we take a lot to the ballot and I have had the pleasure and privilege of working on early childhood tax measures um, at the state and local level. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, I thought I should tell you a little bit about Colorado just uh, to give you some point of comparisons. There's a lot of information on this slide and I'm sure we can share these slides following today's meeting. So if you wanna click on any of these links and check this stuff out, you're welcome to. Um, a couple of things I just wanna highlight on here because I think they're relevant as you consider what parts of the Colorado experience are relevant in Louisiana. Um, the first is just sort of the nature of our state. Um, we've got about 5.7 million people. The majority of our population is concentrated in urban centers along what we call the front range of, uh, which is a reference to the sort of spine of mountains that runs north to south in Colorado. The Denver metro area is obviously the biggest of our communities, but um, we've got a long corridor of urban centers that runs from Colorado Springs up north to Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, but the majority, uh, the, the um, square mileage majority of our state is considered rural. And in terms of the rural communities that we have, um, we've got a lot of ranching and ag communities for sure, but we also have some sort of unique rural communities, which we refer to as rural resort communities. And these are communities whose economies are really driven by the outdoor adventure tourism economy. So uh, ski resort communities, other places that you may have uh, visited. I mentioned that because a few of them we'll talk about later today, and they do have sort of unique economic um, and tax based considerations that perhaps make them a little different from other parts of uh, rural America. Another thing that I wanna highlight that I think is really important to understanding Colorado is that we are a strong local control state. We have 64 counties, 179 school districts and 272 municipalities. And when you talk to elected leaders from any of those communities, they are quick to point out how and why their community is unique and different from any other community in Colorado and why the lessons uh, and experiences of other communities aren't relevant in their communities. And so I believe strongly in the importance of localizing solutions, but also learning um, best practices and lessons from other communities. Um, another thing that I wanna highlight really quickly is um, this top part of uh, the first bullet on the right side there. Um, we have uh, statutorily established regional early childhood councils in the state of Colorado. We have 34 of them, so they do not align to other political boundaries. These early childhood councils are really um, charged with being cross-sector, cross-domain collaborative um, entities um, that help to advance early childhood. The other thing, oh, can we go back on the slide just a second? Sorry. The other thing that I'll just note really quickly is the second bullet here about the early childhood framework. Um, our state has adopted, again, a multi-domain framework that looks at what children need from um, the prenatal stage to eight, age eight to be successful across the domains of health, education, and family formation. A lot of what I'm going to talk about today focuses more squarely on the early care and education piece of that work. Um, but I come from a healthcare background and a public health background and believe strongly that one of the uh, most important parts of early childhood work is the fact that it is not um, siloed, that it really is cross domain and, and really critically important to think about. Okay, so we can move on to the next slide. Um, I want to touch quickly on um, a new funding source that was approved in Colorado just last year, November of 2020. Colorado voters approved a statewide nicotine tax. So this is a dedicated tax that was in addition to our existing tobacco tax and a new tax on nicotine vape products. Um, it's a gradual tax increase that once it's fully implemented in 2027 will generate an estimated $230 million a year for a universal pre-K program. Um, when I say universal pre-K, I wanna unpack that a little bit. Um, Pre-K meaning that it is focused only on that uh, last year of preschool before kindergarten, so focused only on four-year-olds. Um, and it is universal in that everyone will be eligible to benefit from it regardless of family income. 
Um, but it will only provide a minimum benefit of 10 hours a week. There will be some additional benefit that's yet to be determined for students with additional need, um, but it is universal and everyone's eligible. It will not cover uh, the cost of full-time uh, preschool. I point this out um, to say that even when states make uh, great strides and have tremendous wins like passing statewide tax initiatives, there is still room and opportunity for local communities to um, supplement what the state um, is doing. I think what's perhaps most exciting about the new funding, in addition obviously to the $230 million of dedicated revenue, is that voter approval um, created an opportunity for our governor and our legislature to re-examine the systems and structures at the state level that guide and implement our early childhood programs. So they're using this moment of implementing the new universal pre-K program to restructure state agencies, bring better alignment to funding sources, um, and hopefully create a more rational and transparent state infrastructure that will allow our local communities to connect better um, and better leverage resources at the local level. So if we shift, I can talk a little bit about um, the existing local public financing picture in Colorado. Um, so we have five communities in our state that have dedicated public funding streams. Um, I want to just note really quickly, these are all cities and counties. This does not include school districts that have built preschool funding in through their mill levies, but these are um, municipalities and counties that have pursued dedicated funding streams. Um, the first group, one on this list, Aspen, Colorado, you may have heard of before. Um, they were sort of the pioneers in this, and they passed their dedicated tax in 1990. Um, these have gained in popularity and interest in the 2000s, um, with the Denver Preschool Program being established in 2006, uh, the Summit County's first tax being passed in 2007, Boulder County in 2010, San Miguel County in 2017, and Summit County actually going back for a second dedicated tax in 2018. Um, I mentioned this just because, um, as Elizabeth said, I've had the privilege and pleasure of working on uh, a lot of this work over the last 20 years, and we have seen um, a tremendous evolution and understanding about the importance of public investment in early care and education over 20 years. Um, the conversations that we were having about uh, the establishment of the Denver Preschool Program in, in 2006 were very much about just defining what is childcare, why does it matter, um, how does brain development work, um, and, the, and what's exciting and encouraging to see, um, and which has been uh, borne out in public opinion research financed by the Children's Funding Project and, uh, and other public opinion research, is that voters get that now. They understand that preschool and childcare matter. And so now it's less of a question of how do we convince voters, how do we explain to voters what this is all about and why it matters? And it's more a question of how do we convince them that it's a good place to invest public resources. And so it's been interesting to watch that evolution over time. Um, as Elizabeth noted, there are a lot of different ways uh, to structure these local funding entity or funding streams. Um, they are all either dedicated sales or property taxes. Some are focused uh, birth to five across the early childhood continuum. Some are preschool only, threes and fours. Some are universal, meaning that every child who lives within the geographic boundary is eligible for some benefit. And some are means tested, meaning that they're really focused only on kids who present some sort of need, whether it's family income need, developmental need, et cetera. Um, some are early childhood only, and in some cases, um, specifically Aspen, Boulder um, in particular, early childhood was paired with some other health or human service need, and a tax was dedicated for a broader um, purpose. In Aspen, it's housing and child care, and in Boulder, it's sort of a human services safety net tax. All five of these components include some sort of subsidy to help offset the cost of early care and education for families. Um, but many of these communities have also recognized that early childhood systems need workforce development supports. 
and or quality improvement and capital need supports. And so while they all include some sort of subsidy component to just offset the cost of tuition, many of them are multifaceted. Um, most of these at, passed at least initially with some sort of sunset provision, meaning that the tax was time limited to 8, 10, 12, or 15 years, and that voter reapproval was necessary. Um, interestingly, what we've seen um, is that as they've been reauthorized, the sunset provisions have either been extended to 20 plus year reauthorization periods or dropped altogether. So that's a quick look at what we have. Uh, we also have um, in state statute, a new option for local funding that has not yet been actualized, um, but that is now available to Colorado's communities. So Elizabeth was just talking about special districts. Um, we in Colorado are big fans of special districts. We have more than 2,500 special districts in our state set up for everything from libraries to recreation centers to um, forest health and safety, mental health, et cetera. Um, but we didn't have authorization to enable um, a special district specifically for early care and education until 2019. Um, in 2019, our General Assembly passed with bipartisan support House Bill 1052, which just created the state authorization or the state enabling um, sort of place in statute where local communities could um, establish a special district uh, for early care and education. Um, the real benefit of this is that it enables a community to define itself based on how its economy and social structures work, rather than being confined to a specific city or county or school district's existing political boundary. What we find in Colorado is that many working parents cross school district or county or municipal lines as they travel between home and work and that they're oftentimes looking for childcare closer to the place that they work rather than the place that they live. And so by, uh, by enabling a regional approach, we enable communities to work together and give more flexibility to working families to find the childcare in the location that makes the most sense for them. The other real benefit of a regional approach is that it allows um, communities that have a higher tax base and perhaps a more liberal uh, voter base to partner up with communities that have less resources or less political will and, and share or distribute resources across a greater geographic boundary. Um, we passed this bill by positioning it really as um, a local control measure. We should enable our local communities to work together in regional ways to best serve the kids and families in their communities. We talked about it as building on the successful model. You know, if we if we enable special districts for um, mosquito control or for forest health or mental health, why wouldn't we allow local control and special districts for early care and education? Um, we talked about early childhood services um, as being important, but to be honest, um, that was only one part of the messaging of the bill when we ran it through the state legislature. Um, and then we have a, an education leadership council that had talked about the importance of regional approaches to education. And so we sort of hitched our star to that wagon when we were um, pushing this legislation through, um, through the state legislature. At this point, we have one community that is actively working to um, pursue the legal process to establish an early childhood special district. Um, they've been working for about six months on it, and my guess is they've got about another year's worth of work to do. As you can imagine, there are a lot of legal process steps uh, to establish a new unit of local government associated with this, um, but I'm working very closely with that community and would be happy to answer questions about it. So just one last sort of takeaway slide, sorry, before I, uh, before I jump. Um, a couple of key takeaway points. Someone could advance the slides. Thank you. Um, so just a couple of things from Colorado. This is not an either or, but really a both and. Um, we think that based on our experience, there have been critical roles both for the state and for local communities to play. Um, we have seen universal challenges, but the need for very localized solutions. So encourage communities to learn from one another, but then to really tailor the solution that works best for your community. 
Um, and then to stay agile and iterative, as I said, I've been doing this work for um, 20 years. A lot of the local communities that passed taxes back in the 90s and the early 2000s are revisiting those taxes as the needs of their landscape adjust and change. And so I would just say that this work never ends. It's just a question of how do you iterate and evolve over time as public understanding and public need changes. So with that, I'll turn Thanks, it back. Cody. <laughs> Great. And I think we can pull the slides down for a bit here and, and get Colton teed up to share. So Colton, you're sort of in a different bucket. You're sort of in that bucket that, that many of the first speakers um, sort of touched on. You don't have a local public dedicated fund in Gothenburg, but tell us some of the creative things that you were able to get going over recent years with public funding. Sure. And uh, thanks, Elizabeth. And I, I appreciate being invited to be on this. Uh, so you pronounce my name Venteicher. Um, if I wanted to be more German, it'd be Venteicher, uh, but my grandma married in uh, way back in the day and said, hey, we need to soften that up. Um, but uh, that's perfectly fine. I'm Colton Venteicher. I'm an attorney um, in small town, Nebraska. So Gothenburg is a community of 3,500 people. Um, uh, we're an hour away from the closest mall. Um, uh, so we, we definitely have that rural feel. Um, I live here with uh, my wife and we have four kids. Uh, our oldest just started kindergarten. Uh, so when I say that, I think it's easy to think, okay, yeah, he's got young kids. That's why, that's why he under, thinks early childhood is important. Um, but really it comes down to what I do with my business and what I do for my community. Um, I work uh, primarily with businesses. If I end up in court as an attorney, I screwed something up very badly. Uh, so I, I work with businesses and I work with uh, communities on different economic development projects. Um, I do that here in the community of Gothenburg too, um, through our Gothenburg Improvement Company, our nonprofit economic development group. Um, and, and about five years ago, I would say, uh, when I moved out here, um, I, I started getting involved with it with that group and really said, okay, I need to establish my, my name out here. I'm from Omaha and nobody knows me. So I'm gonna figure out what our biggest issues are and, and tackle those things. And really I identified housing and childcare as being the two biggest uh, inhibitors to economic development that we see in rural Nebraska. And I'm sure that that is the case uh, across uh, Louisiana as well. Um, and, and so the, the question was, how do we, how do we move that needle? Um, so in terms of need, when we look at childcare, uh, specifically in Gothenburg, I can tell you just anecdotally, um, we've had a provider, I just talked with one a few weeks ago, she has turned down 20 kids in the last three weeks that she cannot serve. Uh, all of our providers in town have a, a year long wait list for infant spots um, in their facilities. So we can all do math. That means before you get pregnant, you need to call your provider and say, hey, can I reserve a spot? A tremendous issue. Um, from a more quantitative standpoint, we see uh, about 70 kids. We believe it's actually higher than that, closer to 100 in our town of 3,500 that don't have access to a licensed child care provider. Uh, and we don't have unlicensed providers here in town. So it, it's a significant need. So as we set out and said, okay, we have this need, how are we gonna fix it? We also had to be aware of our surroundings. So much like Louisiana, uh, Nebraska is a red state. Uh, we are uh, agriculturally based uh, economically. We have a smaller tax base that, that primarily relies on property taxes from our farmers. And so when we talk about providing solutions, we have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, anytime you talk about a new tax or you talk about increased government spending or involvement in providing that solution, we're going to see a significant amount of pushback. And that's just the, the, the environment that we're in. Um, so if, if you look at different models, and this is what we did, how are people approaching this? Okay, so if we take the, the conservative approach or the uh, traditionally conservative approach, and that is just leave it up to the private market, what would this look like? Uh, we've been talking about putting up a facility that could serve 250 kids. So if we did two things, if we paid our teachers $15 an hour, and if we didn't increase rates for our, um, our, our children and our families, we would operate at about a $400,000 loss uh, each year. We, we discovered this about three and a half years ago and said, oh, we need to take a step back and figure this out. We knew there would be a shortfall, um, but that was really eye-opening for us. So flip it on the other end of the spectrum, and we see this in so, some other communities uh, in our state, and that is 
well, do we just look to the, to the public sector to take care of this? We have some public school systems that provide, at the very least, uh, a public preschool program. Uh, some of our communities provide childcare for all of, uh, all of the kids in need in their community. Well, what does that do? So if we know at the private market at $15 an hour, it's not economical. Well, I can assure you, if you're paying a teacher, you're paying them a, a union-based teacher, you're paying them more than $15 an hour. But if you take a step beyond that, and specifically you look at those preschool programs, what we have seen happen in especially these smaller town communities is you have a public school come in, they start a preschool program that's free. So we don't have the ability to compete as a private individual because there's that free option. But what also happens is we are taking out of those private programs really our most profitable kids. We all know based on ratios, we can have more kids in the classroom per adult in those older classrooms. Well, if we take those older kids out, we're losing that, that, that profit, the higher margin kids in our, in our model, and it makes the model even worse for those private providers that are treating, that are working with zero to three-year-olds. So we shied away from that approach too, and we took a step back and we said, okay, we've got to figure out how to come up with a private public solution. Uh, and in Gothenburg, what that entails, uh, like I said, it's a new facility. That's just what we needed in our community. Um, but it includes some public involvement. So the first thing we did was we went to our local school district. They had a private, a public preschool program that served 15 kids. That cost them about $175,000 to $200,000 a year. So we said, all right, if we take that program over, if we incorporate it into our new business, uh, would you still be willing to allocate that much funds towards childcare and actually flow it to assist or support our operating model? Um, that was something we, we got great support from the school on, and actually we have formal approval now for $175,000 a year of operating support. We pivoted after that because we knew that one seventy five dollars from the school wasn't going to get us to the finish line. We started talking to the city. Uh, we said, all right, this is a community issue. This is an economic development issue. How can we get you on board here? Um, I'll get into how we got them on board in a second, but Fiscally, what that looks like is $100,000 a year of operating support. It's going to our bottom line to make sure that we can pay our teachers $15 an hour, which is still not enough, um, and, and not charge exorbitant rates um, for our families. We moved forward. Uh, if you're in a small town, what are your big staples in the community? The, the local municipality, the school, and the hospital, the healthcare provider. So we started talking to our hospital it's the biggest employer in town. We empl uh, our hospital employs about 170 people. They currently support our YMCA in our community. Um, we're the smallest town in the country to have a YMCA. We're very proud of it. And the way that we're able to do it is our hospital supports them financially. So I knew from the very beginning, I can't go and say, hey, I need cash. Uh, that was just a non-starter. Um, but what we did say was, hey, you're the biggest employer in town. Can you lead the charge for a new movement when it comes to uh, employee benefits. Um, and we got a great response from the hospital. So our hospital has committed to providing employer provided childcare uh, to every employee um, of the hospital. And that's for any licensed provider uh, in my community, not just our new facility. So what that does for us is we can charge full rate um, to all of those families, even if they have some folks making, um, making uh, lower, lower incomes. Um, but we also have one single consistent payor uh, across all of those folks, and we don't have to track down uh, anybody to make their payments each month. So that helps out our model from an operational standpoint. Again, that's what we looked at initially. We, we set out and said, okay, if we're going to do this, it doesn't matter how big the building is or how much it costs, we need to keep the lights on. So based on that approach, we were able to figure that piece out. But actually, we were able to go a step farther. Um, we have seen a commitment of $2.4 million towards our $11 million capital campaign um, uh, towards capital that's going to come from the city, the school, and the hospital. Really, the reason we're able to do that is because we are taking on some of the needs that those groups otherwise would have to meet for their community members uh, if we weren't here. Um, and we're doing so really in a way that would be cheaper. And so it's a win-win for those groups. 
So just a few points I wanna hit on because I do think it's important. And I know we've talked about dedicated funding streams. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll point out that these are just through our standard mill levies. Uh, these are not, are not additional taxes. Basically our community leaders uh, sat down uh, with our group and said, all right, let's figure out a way to do this. This is a priority for our residents. Um, we don't have the, the opportunity or the ability to wait to figure this out. So let's find room in our budgets. And they did. Um, so first thing we did was establish partnerships uh, very early on. And I'm talking with the city, the school and the hospital. So I can, I can appreciate Mayor Ellis's uh, strong support for, for early childhood programs and stuff like that, but we don't have that support uh, across all of our different public bodies. So what I had to do uh, as the guy that's not tied to any of those public entities is really go politic and lobby those folks and say, hey, let's come together. Let's, let's work together to find the solution for the betterment of everybody else. Um, and so what we saw at the very beginning of this process about three, four years ago was a formal commitment uh, to fund my group's operations to hire a full-time employee. Um, that's a big deal for us. We got $40,000 from those entities, um, the city, the school, and the hospital, uh, so that we could hire somebody who could actually do this, help us do this work. Um, so again, those early on partnerships were big. Secondly, we educated the public. Uh, we utilize social media, uh, the radio, the local newspapers. We held public events. Um, we held public meetings on the importance of early childhood. And it wasn't just a lecture series. It was just getting the information out there. Hey, here's a statistic that you might find interesting. Uh, here's an important piece of information uh, tied to how our school has improved their testing now that we have 100% of our kids, our kindergartners, entering school having attended preschool. We can quantify that and show that to the public. So it's been really a three or four year public information education campaign uh, that has really paid dividends here at the end. And then the last piece is we targeted their priorities. So obviously this is a school issue. Uh, nobody's saying it's not, but when I approached the city, the response I got was, hey, that's a school issue. Is that my, is that my problem? Do I need to be using city general fund dollars for this? And so we had to pivot a little bit. We had to ask them, okay, what is a, a worthwhile expenditure of your funds if we were to do this project? And something that came about from that was, well, our residents have been saying, we really need a community center. We need a place where we can have wedding receptions, banquets, conferences. And so we incorporated that into our capital structure and into our operating model um, so that, and primarily the cost tied to the city, if they were to do it on their own, would be tied to overhead, uh, utilities, upkeep and whatnot, insurance, uh, and, and staffing. Well, I can create economy or efficiencies by having this existing operation, this childcare facility co-located where that facility is. We were able to meet their need um, and make sure that to the public, this looked like a great investment because we're knocking out two birds with one stone. Um, so those priorities are identifying those priorities and then just problem solving uh, really, I think is what got us from point A to point B in terms of, of being successful here. Um, so just a little quick recap of, of where we are right now. Um, we asked our first donor for funds uh, end of last year in December. Uh, as of September of this year, we've raised about six and a half million dollars towards our $11 million capital campaign fund. Um, we expect with some grant applications that will be over nine here by uh, the end of December. Um, so quick, quick response from our community um, from that first ask to now, um, but again, it really started three, four or five years ago uh, in terms of working with, with these different individuals. Thanks. Colton, that's such an amazing story and you tell it so well, by the way, we should, we did record you. So I'm gonna get that recording from you, Karen. <laughs> um, and, and now Kathleen, I want to turn to you. I know we're a little bit off time, but I think it's okay. Um, to the task force, be thinking of questions that you have for this group, but then I also want to pose some questions back to you all based on some stuff that we sent around. So Kathleen Blair, um, I really appreciate you joining us because I know Allie on my team has spoken with you and you're, I believe, retired from the Okeechobee 
um, Children's Services Fund. So you're on mute, but if we can get you to unmute and um, share just a little bit about what this looks like in um, Florida and, and particularly in Okeechobee County, which is another pretty small town America place. You're still muted, I don't know. Um, there you go. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm unmuted now. You are. <laughs> Yes, I uh, supposedly am retired. I was the director of special education in our county for 29 years. Um, and then also for the rest of my career, I did. I worked 39 years all in Okeechobee County. Um, Florida came uh, back in 1989 developed a, a law that said that any county could uh, start a Children's Services Council or a Juvenile Services Board, depending on what they, they wanted to call it. Um, it included that we could provide a tax, it was an extra tax, um, four children. So um, six of us out of 67 counties um, developed in 1990 um, a Children's Services Council following the, the Jacksonville model, which was the first one in, in Florida. So we're allowed to provide um, a extra tax that goes on the property taxes. It's based on property tax and the millage can be uh, up to 50 cents per thousand dollars of property tax. Um, each year, uh, my council meets and decides how much um, do we want to tax? How much do we need to provide the services? Now our services do include early childhood um, services, but that's just one of the many things that we provide. We do provide for every child in Okeechobee County, zero through 18 by doing requests for proposals for agencies. We don't provide it, we provide the money. So, um, we we were in, invested in 1990. Um, I we did we did the uh, way back when uh, people stood in the corners of of the main street with signs, um, vote for Children's Services Council. We did town hall meetings. Um, we used the radio. We used the newspaper um, to to talk about Children's Services Council and what it could provide. Because we kept hearing um, through, the, uh, through the school board that there was nothing for our children to do after school hours. Um, since that time, Florida has developed a uh, early childhood preschool program. So any child in Florida age that is four years old and would start kindergarten the following year um, receives a half a day free um, public education for, for preschools. It could be through a private um, daycare center that's certified by license, or it could be through our school system. We're very small, um, about, uh, at one point, I think um, about 43,000 people, um, probably 143,000 cows. <laughs> that's our, that's <laughs> our way of uh, uh, our agriculture. So we have more cows than we do have people. Um, but we, we have people that care because we had no problems voting the extra tax. Um, and we did. We decided as a group that it was. We did not need fifty cents 
per thousand um, dollars. And every year we kind of play around with the amount of money that we have and the amount of agencies that we have and the programs that we need. And so we, we modify it every year. So this year it's um, 36 cents per thousand uh, dollars of property tax. You have to understand too, we have a lot of people in mobile homes, um, they do not pay a property tax. So our tax base is quite low. Um, but with that 36 cents um, per thousand dollars, we and the money that we've saved over time, um, we do have a budget around a, a million and a half. And part of that money does go to preschool uh, early learning coalitions. Um, and I heard that somebody said that they have early coalitions and that's true. At one time, there were 67 early learning coalitions. That's the amount of counties we have in Florida, 60, 67. Um, and that became a, a minor nightmare um, because there were so many people that were in charge um, that nothing was getting done. And so it became important that um, counties that surrounded each other um, came together and pooled our money. And that made it uh, a, you know, a bigger amount of money for children so that they could go to preschool. Um, and so we have, I think, um, the last I heard about 21 early learning coalitions in Florida. Some do better than others. Ours is, uh, ours works very well. Um, the counties that surround us, um, Martin and Indian River and Okeechobee have come, come together. Um, and we work well together. What? The, children, the uh, executive director for Children's Services Council has a four-year term on that uh, early learning co coalition. Um, and unfortunately, mine is coming back up again. Um, so, but um, as far as uh, Children's Services Council, um, it, it is uh, you know, funded by the tax. Um, I was, there's, there's a requirement of 10 people on the board. Um, five are required by law and then five are appointed by our governor. Um, and originally back in 1990, I was a governor appointment. Um, we, well, they serve a four year, excuse me, four year term. I did three four-year terms, and then the governor at that time decided that um, somebody else maybe would uh, take my place as a, as a member of the Children's Services Council. Problem was, I happened to be the only one that knew every law <laughs> that affected Children's Services Council, because we are an independent taxing authority you kind of, we have to provide the same amount of audits, the same amount of laws and um, as a, a regular taxing authority. So um, they asked me to be executive director. Um, I do not get a salary, I get a stipend. I do not want a salary. Um, you have to understand we live in a little teeny corner of the school board. Um, so we don't have to pay rent. Um, we use their internet service, so we don't have to pay for that. And the whole goal was that the school board said, if we could do that, um, we could provide more services to the children. And that's what we do. You know, we're, we provide it all year long. We have special projects that come up, you know, like uh, our county fair, um, is one of the special projects. Um, we have an, an ag venture where our, all our fourth graders get to go 
and learn about milking cows and and where do, where does meat come from and things like that. Um, so we pay for special projects, and then we also have a next another program called summer programs. Um, so the kids can have the ability to go to camp, and and uh, these different agencies provide scholarships for kids that would not be able to go to camp because of their you know their parents yes, couldn't yes. afford the tuition. So um, we're busy. Uh, busier than, um, you know, sometimes it's like, wait a minute, I'm retired, I think. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I keep going. Um, I'm, I am fortunate that um, when it first started, even though I worked as the director of special education, they sort of combined it into uh, my, my paid job. Um, and my secretary at the time um, took the minutes of the meetings and did all of the, the paper part of uh, having a taxing authority. And um, luckily she has stayed with me um, through both of our retirements. So we're both retired, but we're still with children all the time. So, well, um, it, it's really, Kathleen, it's a testament to how you make it work in a rural community, right? Where where it's all relative. And, and you know, I've heard folks say a number of times all around the country, oh, well, this can't happen in rural America. And you are sort of a can. testament to it can absolutely happen in rural America. And it's just going to look different. You know, it's going to it's going to have a different amount of administrative overhead, it's going to have a different, you know, uh, sort of reach into maybe surrounding counties, what have you, it, but, but I think that it's, it's really um, great to hear your story. I'm hoping that we can get you and, and Colton and Cody to help us. Um, Karen, as we have folks asking questions of this group, I'd love to, to have the questions really be um, thinking ahead to the next task force meeting where we can really roll up our sleeves and think about what's the right structure to recommend um, in Louisiana based on some of these really excellent examples um, that, that we've heard. And so how, how can we ask some questions now that will help us in, in that discussion um, that we'll have at the December task force meeting? Well, and I would, Love to jump in, Kathleen, with a question, which, you know, I would just appreciate whatever answer you can provide to it, because I'm very interested in how you drew together several rural counties that bordered each other, because um, prior to joining the department, I worked out in our child care resource and referral world, and we benefited from school readiness tax credits here in Louisiana. And there were just frankly some regions of the state where donors and parishes were very happy for us to use a regional approach for dividing up resources, but also other areas of the state that said the money raised in our parish must go back to our parish. Yes, we don't want to share any of it because we tried to talk about leveraging it and, you know, providing significant coverage, of course, in the donor parishes, but combining some services and, and giving portions of total um, dollars, spreading it around. And we, we encountered no resistance in some areas and a great deal of resistance in others. So I would just be curious of any strategies that you all used that we might learn from. I, I, I really think um, we were quite fortunate because we have um, had other councils that included um, four counties. They're actually, um, we skipped a county um, because they chose to do their own thing with their own money. They felt like that they had enough money. Um, so the, the bordering county, St. Lucie County, just decided just to have their own. Um, and the, the state allowed them, even though they didn't have the number that they were supposed to have. Um, so, but by, by adding Martin County, 
um, and then uh, skipping St. Lucie County and then going to Indian River, we all knew each other. And that's one of the, the um, I think the positives in, in, in being small and rural. They knew us, <laughs> you know, they knew what we could, we could do. They knew that we could provide um, some assistance. Um, a lot of the times the executive director actually worked in, in the school board, you know, at, at, at one time in their career. Um, so it just kind of, everything all fell together at, at that point, you know, but um, it, we know, I mean, there's 67 counties in, in Florida. And at this point, I believe we're at 10 children's services councils throughout the state of Florida. Um, so we have a long way to go. You know, it, it is not easy to say to your tax people, your, to the regular citizens, we wanna get, we wanna add a tax to, the, to your tax um, amount. Um, you get a lot of questions about, well, it's already too high, you know, and then and, and you go, yeah, but what are, what are your children doing? And then the big thing comes out that, well, I don't have any children. <laughs> um, and then you're like, but did you? And what did they do when, when uh, they were little? Um, and this is helping the next generation come up and be ready for kindergarten and that's the big thing you know our, by providing the mental health services that that we're certainly lacking in in rural counties um and getting those kids to be able to know what it means to sit in a chair and uh, be a student um, and then have homework and and have the parents learn that, you know, so that, that's and, one thing that helps. Yeah, and Cody, I think in, in Colorado, one of the things you said that could be compelling is that people want care in different parts of the region, right? So, so that could help sort of mix it up a little bit. I would think that, you know, people are going to be moving around to get care and isn't it better to give them a little bit broader region yeah. to work within. So two quick, really quick thoughts on that. Um, in one part of the state in Colorado, uh, we have a 140 mile region that sort of functions together as an economy, even though it's multiple counties and municipalities. And so if you can get um, a region that identifies an economic travel pattern um, with commuters, you can, you can maybe find ways to knit folks together. Um, another community in Colorado um, is a, a geographically large county that has three distinct communities within it. And so for them, they're looking at a countywide tax with um, a governance structure that will enable the flexibility to allow each community within the county some autonomy in how to spend the dollars. So the idea being, you know, politically, we're better off if we go to the taxpayers together um, and make a countywide pitch, uh, but we need to en enable some flexibility to allow localized solutions. And I'm sure that Mayor Ellis and Superintendent Narcisse and um, John Diaz are probably multitasking given their jobs, but, um, but if you all have any questions for these folks um, that, that this discussion has raised for you, I'd be curious to hear. Um, like Mayor Ellis is maybe going to say something, but maybe not. And I'm also interested from our Louisiana folks, you know, what you're accomplishing so much, but what are the barriers that remain? What are the obstacles that this task force and that our commission might help address at a state level? No, I was just going to say that I, I really appreciate um, the fact that um, you guys are doing what you're going to what you're doing. But it also gives us some ideas of how, you know, as you talked about um, working across county lines over there and uh, 
in uh, Okeechobee. Um, spent a lot of time in Sarasota as a kid, so uh, I've uh, I've been through your part of the the country. But no, really, uh, all the things that you guys are doing and and, and the programs you're putting together, uh, even Colton, the way that you, in a sense, had to beg, steal, and borrow from everybody there, you know. Uh, and what that did was it, it, it pulled everybody together to realize this is a community-wide issue. And I love how you went to your biggest employer and, 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 and got that commitment from them. We see locally, too, one of our biggest employers, uh, St. Francis Hospital, is the same thing. They're looking for child care, uh, quality child care for their employees as well. So you have now given me a little uh, something to go across the street, in a sense, and, uh, and, and go talk to their, their CEO about. But no, I just, outside of that, I, I really do I appreciate everything that you guys have brought to the table. And I'm so glad I got to sit in on this conversation. Uh, and sounds like just a little more work for me, which is always good. Uh, but uh, when you talked about barriers, I mean, I think our biggest barrier, I mean, as a state, I mean, it's just a mindset of, of what importance are we gonna put on this? I mean, you know, it's kind of like broadband is the buzzword right now, uh, but you can always tell where people uh, I've always been told a long time ago, you always tell people where they, where, they, where they invest their time and money are the things that they care about. If we truly want to say that, that this is it, we have to, have to find ways to, to bring it to the table like Colton and Kathleen and Cody. So, um, but it is a mindset. I think our biggest, um, our biggest hurdle that we're going to have to do is convince folks that this is a worthy investment um, and, and to get them past that to, to get all bought in. So others on the task force that want to that wanna ask any questions while we've got such smart people here with us? I would love to see that, like with the work in Colorado and elsewhere, like the state enabling legislation to understand how we could use that. Because it's been the place that we've, I feel like we've had the most hiccup. Um, and now that we've got locals doing this work in the way that they are, like we heard today, like what's the way that, to Karen's point, what's the way that we can support them to have sustainable revenue to move forward? Because we know even with all this federal investment that's on the horizon, horizon, we still have to have local state investment to make sure we're covering all of our kids. In particular, and I know we've talked about this a good bit too, is like in our more rural areas of the state, how do we make sure we're doing this equitably too? Mm -hmm. And it's the trickiest piece. Yeah. So just a couple of quick thoughts. One, I'm very happy to share the legislation. I'd also be very happy to share the fact sheets and some of the accompanying materials, like how we sort of positioned it in Colorado to make it work. Um, a second thought about equity is because that's certainly a, a key consideration and focus for us and frankly a driving reason behind the regionality of the special districts for early childhood. Um, we see huge inequities among our school districts um, based on what they can generate in local funding from their property tax base, right, like home valuations being what they are. And so um, if you can get over the um, provincialism of it, I just want to keep the money that's raised in my community in my community and can use an equity lens to help promote regionalism, um, we actually think that there's tremendous opportunity to advance equity through a regional approach um, if that is one of the, the key um, sort of filters or lenses through which you're, you're looking to advance this work. And Cody, maybe there's some ways that the state can incentivize really encouraging people to think regionally about exactly. this, right? Like maybe that's a part that gets built into what the state's going to do. Exactly. And maybe that changes what state matching dollars are right. available or it changes um, sort of what autonomy is provided to a district if they meet certain thresholds around equity, um, et cetera. Um, so happy to share that, happy to sort of brainstorm with you around the equity pieces. Oh, there was a third thought, but it's just run out of my, out of my mind. If it comes back to me, Libby, I'll let you know. <laughs> you know, I, I think there's folks within our state that, that really don't understand or grasp the gravity of the 5th Congressional District uh, here in Northeast Louisiana. It is one of the poorest congressional districts in the United States. When we talk about school districts like Tallulah, 
that have one certified teacher in the entire school district, you know, you could raise the property tax millage and wouldn't be able to cover probably five seats in some of these areas. So, you know, I, I think that that it is, uh, you're right. I think the, the, the juice has to come from Baton Rouge. The juice has to come from a statewide initiative because it is, uh, you know, this, it, it's, it's a dire situation when you actually put boots on the ground. And, you know, that's one thing that Ashley wanted to put together pre-pandemic was start what she called the Bessie bus <laughs> and have everyone that sit on the board of elementary and secondary education actually tour each other's districts. Because what the thing that Monroe has, and I, I can tell you that I say we're blessed in the sense is we have a tax base. We are the parish seat, um, you know, and, and that's why we as an elected official in me and Monroe had the opportunity to do that. But I can't imagine being in Richland Parish and at, being the mayor of Rayville uh, to talk about where are we going to get these dollars from. And, um, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting discussion to be had to have. And, I, and I'm so thankful for leaders like that, like Kathleen and those who, who made that commitment to, uh, to draw those folks together. Yeah. Cody. I remembered my thought. <laughs> um, I was struck in other convers in the conversations we've been having just about the component parts of all of this, right? So people have talked about the need to build facilities and go raise capital to do that. We've talked about workforce, right? How do you offer a living wage to, ena in to enable staffing of these facilities? We've talked about subsidies to pay help families offset tuition. And one of the things that I would just encourage y'all to think about um, is what is the right funding source for what piece of the puzzle? Um, and how do you leverage, um, how do you think about sort of building a, a public finance or a public private financing package really, um, and be most creative about maximizing the right funding source for the right purpose and building um, the kind of political uh, support that you need for the funding source at hand, right? Um, it's obviously one-time capital dollars look really different than sustainable workforce subsidy, you know, salary supplement dollars. And so how do you, how do you piece together the funding package that makes the most sense? Maybe Karen, um, Barbara Freiburg here. Um, I'm impressed with what these uh, regional councils are able to do in these states. And uh, I don't know if there's any way the the legislature can incentivize this or what we need to do as a legislature. But um, as a rep, I'm willing to look at that uh, legislation from uh, Colorado and, uh, and see what we can uh, do here in Louisiana, because you know, this is one of the reasons I ever ran for office. And, um, you know, I thought the three models we just looked at were, were, were outstanding and, and whatever we can do um, to, to, to get this, this going um, as it has in a few parishes that were highlighted today. Uh, I'm here to work with you. We're excited about that because I think the opportunity is great at the end of the day and that we get this right for Louisiana children. Uh, and I know that, you know, Karen and I talk about this often is like, what is the state enabling legislation? Should it look like? Can it look like? And so having models like from Colorado to look at it and see how we can work together to tweak it for the Louisiana context will be increasingly important. And I think like that's part of the body of work for the task force is to is to look at that as well and to figure it out. The other thing that we have going on, as our task force members know, is that we're working with the Blanco Center at ULL to understand what's already existing in place that could potentially help support our, um, our early care and education system in the state too. Karen, would you add anything else? We really do appreciate it, Representative Freiburg. Um, I think that we have a lot of questions that we want to look at. You know, Cody, yes, thank you so much for sharing the legislation so that this whole task force can be reviewing it before the next meeting. And um, Leslie, would you mind putting the questions up? The slide. Uh, there's a slide the that has the kind of components that we would need to think about. And I think, Karen, the, um, yep. the next, the next one, one, Leslie. Because I think that um, what we really 
you know, we're having great discussion, but I think everybody has a lot to process and think over and think through. And so I think if we can continue this discussion now, but also come to our next meeting with some additional questions and thoughts regarding this um, so that we can figure out what we need to recommend. Karen, I would love to hold together a small group um, from, from this task force and maybe we could uh, get Cody to join too and, and just have a working session to work through some of these things to bring sort of a straw man to the table. And Representative Freiburg, if you, I mean, clearly having a legislative eye on, on this um, would, be, would be so helpful. So whether your preference would be have a work group sort of look at the Colorado legislation and work through some of these questions to make them Louisiana specific and bring it to you or participate in something like that. I think that could be really useful going into the next task force meeting to have and then really just use that task force meeting to hammer out some details. And I, knowing- I knowing think that's a good first step and I, I would love to um, work with you in any way I can. Great. Great. And then Libby, I know that when it comes to the very first question here on this first component, mm -hmm. we'll have the information coming later from um, the Blanco. work at the Blanco Center. But I think if we can figure out some of these other things, it might. Yeah. And I also think it's just, it's the time is now. I mean, as Representative Freiburg knows, and many of us know, is session will be here in a blink of an eye. Um, and whatever we can do to, to front load and with the task force support, and all the smart people on the task force to help us hammer out those details would be fantastic. Yes, Libby, that would be really important because I could start to get legislation drafted now. Uh, that would be important, uh, particularly um, after the holidays uh, to get some, some legislation drafted to get research done that needs to be done uh, to see what we have and how we can coordinate what we do have. That's great. And I think we can add to these questions that we sent out um, rather late yesterday, my apologies, but we can add to these questions, the questions we just mentioned about, you know, can we incentivize regional supports and regional work as well? well I'll, I'll sign up for the small working group. Uh, great. And I know some of our task force members had to leave early today for, for conflicting meetings, so we will you know, share this opportunity with them as well, but would love for as many of you on this call today who can participate to sign up. And is it appropriate if we, like I know with our team at the Policy Institute um, to bring in other team members that would be helpful to this process as well? My perspective it is, I would assume okay. more Leslie, heads, I have better. no idea if there are any, yeah, I don't know if there are any Rules about that. What's a work? It would be a work group of the task right. force. So I'm we, thinking it would not be a problem, but I defer to Leslie on that. I know we've done it in the past, so I just wanted to double check. No, I think it would be helpful to have some some ideas mapped out to jump into at our next meeting. Great, so you'll pull an email together that has sort of the, the detailed questions that a work group would tackle, and then we'll get volunteers if there's any others um, that, that want to join in on that work group and put something together to put in front of the task force in December. I see that we are running close on time, um, but while we have these amazing speakers here, are there any final questions that have come to anyone's mind that you would like to ask? right now. I will say that they have um, graciously in the chat box said that they would make themselves available or be happy to chat um, offline. So if you do think of other questions, if you would please email them to me so that I can share them with the speakers and we could share that information back out. Um, I know Elizabeth and I talked about trying to um, put together some notes from today as well. We'll make the recording available to all of you, but, but jotting down and condensing some of the notes about the strategies so that we can share that with task force members, information like what Cody said she would share with us, um, additional questions 
just so that everyone really has the opportunity, whether on that work group or not, to be thinking through some of these questions and some of these issues um, and some ideas before the December 8th meeting. I do think you know it's really critical that we use that time strategically on the 8th for developing a set of recommendations and information to share back with the commission. But I also wanted to know from this group whether there are any other speakers or any other issues that you feel like we do also need to discuss that we haven't brought to you yet this year. Um, one of the things, for example, that we would like to do is at least discuss the Build Back Better plan and the implications of that if it passes for the state, but would love to hear whether there are any other speakers or topics that would benefit this task force in its deliberations. Okay, well, if again, as with everything else, if you think of anything um, in the next couple of weeks, please just email me and let me know. So, um, Leslie, is there anything we need to do to, oh, one other thing. Leslie, could you advance the slide by two, I think, to get to our schedule? So, um, December 8th, we realized recently we also have an early literacy commission that day. And so we wanted to see if we could move the task force meeting back. And instead of starting at 12, start it at 2 and run from 2 to 4 p.m. So we can send out an updated calendar invitation. OK, I hope that means most people can make that accommodation. We really appreciate it. Obviously, both commissions are working on extremely important issues for our youngest learners. So we will send out that updated information and we'll be sending out a lot of material to reflect on and review and uh, maybe a little pre-work before our December 8th meeting. So appreciate everyone's time today and hope that this has given you a great deal of food for thought that um, that you'll be ready to come back with specific recommendations at the work group meeting or at the December 8th meeting. Leslie, do we need to formally adjourn? Hello? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yes, can I have first a motion to um, a motion to receive the last update. This is Libby, so moved. And a second. From a task force member. I see Melissa is still on. Melissa, okay. I don't want to hold us up. So I will just say that we are adjourning at one minute before two o'clock. Thank, Thank you. you, Leslie. Thank you, everyone.